Anything is possible. New freezer has a lot of them. We made it, guys. Thank you, uh, Doug. Thanks for hopping in, everybody. This is Doug Bouton. Am I pronouncing your name correct? Last name correctly? It's Bouton, but nobody ever gets Bouton. It. Sorry, Bouton. <laughs> okay, Doug Bouton. <laughs> well, uh, Doug, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I've been a fan of yours since you know the early 2010s. Been following your story. It's really incredible. Um, Doug was uh, is the president and CEO, or was the president and CEO of Halo Top, and is now the CEO and founder of Halo Top International. Um, one of the most impressive CPG growth stories and also in a category I'm very fond of. So, Doug, thanks for hopping on, man. Um, really appreciate you, you joining the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, you know, want to keep it pretty high level and pretty casual. Um, you know, I know you used to be an attorney by trade, but would love to hear just, you know, where'd you grow up? Who, who, who are you? And, uh, and, you know, how did, how did the journey begin? Yeah, sure thing. I, uh, so I grew up in, uh, in rural Virginia, um, central Virginia, right near Charlottesville. So really close to UVA um, and diehard UVA fan, I have to say. Um, but I ended up, uh, I just went to like the public high school there um, in my town and then ended up going to school in D.C. Um, at Georgetown. So it was really close. It was all that mid-Atlantic area for the first uh, 24 years of my life, because after Georgetown, I ended up going to uh, UVA for law school. So um, for me, it was, uh, I was kind of on the East Coast my whole life, and uh, I wanted to change. So right after law school, without knowing anybody, I picked up and moved to LA. Um, and I How did there. LA compare to your upbringing? You said rural, rural Virginia, initially? Yeah. Uh, How big was the town you grew up in? It was, uh, it was a kind of quintessential one stoplight town. Um, I think when I was growing up, it was probably like eight to 10,000 people. Wow. Um, it's gotten quite a bit bigger now, though. I think it might be about 15,000 or more uh, now. And there might, you know, maybe there's four or five stoplights. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, but yeah, man. And then uh, I moved to LA um, and, you know, I was living on the beach out there, uh, practicing law for all of about a year um, and got connected with, with Justin Wolverton. And we can get into the whole story. But, um, you know, he was a lawyer at a different law firm. He and I met in a lawyer basketball league and uh, just, um, you know, connected and, and the rest is history, I guess. So I guess I'd love to hear a little bit about just early days in law. So, you know, what, what drew you to becoming an attorney? And, you know, what was that? What was that like being out here in LA? Were you working? Like, I know you worked at um, a couple firms, but also you had your own practice. So so what was what was that kind of like for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't enjoy it. But I, I always knew I wouldn't. Um, I think I'd you know, I went to law school because I didn't want to get a job. So I figured, hey, it would it would only open doors, not close them. Um, I didn't really have the foresight to think about the 200 plus thousand in student debt I would graduate with. But, you know, uh, I don't regret it. Um, I'm happy I did it. And then at the law firm itself, you know, I mean, it was kind of it wasn't a, a bad law firm. It wasn't a, a it wasn't bad people. It was it was all great. And the work itself wasn't even that bad. It just I, I didn't have control. Um, and that, that drove me insane that, you know, somebody could tell me when to work, where to work, how to work. Um, I'm a, um, I'm adamant, uh, about kind of my independence when it comes to that kind of stuff. So that, that was my driver, you know, whether it was Halo Top, a, another startup, or again, kind of, you alluded to it, the, the, you know, my own law firm that I, I, I opened for a couple of years to make some money on the side. Um, I, I was always gonna make sure I had kind of the financial freedom to, to do what I want, when I want, how I want. Uh, that, that was the driver for me. And have you always been kind of a self-starter? Like, did you start any companies previously prior to Halo Top or even you started your own law firm? Were there any other startups or things that you were doing early on? Um, there was one other startup um, I was involved with for a period of time. Um, I'm not actually sure what the status of it is now. As far as I know, I don't think uh, there's a product, but I'm not sure if they're they're still around. And then other than that, it was just, um, opening up my own law firm, which wasn't really a, you know, I mean, that was create a website, you know, pay 150 bucks for a virtual office. And that was about it. Um, so yeah, beyond that, I, I didn't have any experience in business or, or entrepreneurship or startups or anything like that. So you're in LA, you have your own law firm, you've been doing that for a while. How, how do you, you know, ice cream, how, how does that, how do you get connected with Justin and, and make the jump and make that transition into starting Halo Top? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense that, you know, two lawyers would, uh, would start making ice cream, go figure. But um, Justin actually, so he had, uh, he had already started um, the company and, and had kind of 
already started the formula in his home kitchen. That's where it started for him. Um, he, you know, w was really looking for kind of that low sugar, healthy option in ice cream that, you know, actually tasted like ice cream, actually had the texture of ice cream, uh, really performed like ice cream. So not only could you eat it, you'd actually want to eat it. That, that was the key. Um, and, and, you know, it got to the point where, you know, he and I were friends and, and our conversations kind of intensified through the end of 2012. And then um, after I quit my law firm, he, you know, approached me and was, you know, asked me, you know, it kind of said, Halo Top is getting to a point um, where, you know, I need to, to bring on a business partner and I can't do it all on my own. And, and uh, that would have been early 2013. I love it. I love it. Well, dude, I, I can relate. I don't know if you knew this, but I used to be an investment banker for almost four and a half years before, you know, leaving my job and making that transition into ice cream. And when you do that, I mean, you get all sorts of opinions and yeah. thoughts and critiques oh, and, oh, you're going to leave stuff. your, you know, your, in, your investment banking, your corporate law job to go sell ice cream. Yeah. So like, I can really resonate. I guess my question to you is when, you know, you're sitting there and you're, you're like, I'm going to go start selling ice cream. Um, how do this is the biggest challenge for for people at the at the at the outset is is how do you make that decision internally and and double down on it and just eliminate the noise and, and other people's opinions to make such a massive career transition? Um, well, number one, uh, not having eye bankers tell me the lowest person on the totem pole what to do uh, help because you guys, you guys would have been the boss of the corporate associate, which, which I, which was me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, David might've been telling Doug to stay up until 2 AM to, you know, do something. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that helped uh, being able to remove that aspect of it. But, um, you know, again, other than that, I, I think it's, it's just the notion of, um, it, and I, I swear it's not arrogance. It's just purely confidence, just being confident in yourself, to where like you give me the opportunity to bet on myself um i'll do it every single time uh, and i won't even think twice about it and that that's kind of what it came down to there's a lot of you know all my peers you know had settled into their law firm jobs all of the senior associates and partners um were definitely like what are you doing that's you know how could you even consider that that's stupid um my parents supported me that was huge um not financially which which may have helped but um you know at least <laughs> emotionally it's it's huge where I can't, I can't imagine having, you know, the, the parents and there's definitely those types of parents who pressure you either passively or, or, you know, explicitly to, you know, it's all about your career. It's all about what they can tell their friends and this and that. I mean, it was to the point where my now wife, Jennifer, when her and I started dating, not her parents, but like her aunts and uncles and extended family, they literally thought I was like pushing around an ice cream cart, you know, selling ice cream on the beach or something. I mean, it was it, it was that bad dude i can resonate so like i can't so profoundly resonate because when i initially told all my colleagues i was quitting it's like so you're gonna go like sell popsicles like at, at the popsicle stand and yep. and and it takes a certain kind of person to frankly just be like i don't give a fuck what other people think and i'm gonna bet on myself and and i just i have so much admiration for people who like yourself dude that's amazing that for those first 12, 24, 36 months, that's what I really want to hear the most about. Like you've been incredibly successful, but what people don't dive into enough is that dark place that you have to go into and that perseverance that's required to just turn off all noise yep. and just triple down on who you are as a human being. Yeah. I mean, I, so watching, I don't know. Did you watch the, uh, the last, um, the last dance, the Jordan documentary? Oh dude, of course. Yeah. Twice. <laughs> so hearing, hearing him talk about, um, greatness and like getting into that zone and it it was a light bulb for me where it's like oh that if you think about like the great athletes and everything they always talk about a zone and but all that it means is just block out the noise like you can't listen that there's so much noise there's so much you know so many people who will tell you you shouldn't do it you can't do it it'll be hard like yeah no shit like i know all of that uh don't care uh, i'm still gonna go do it and i'm gonna try try my try my work my ass off and see what happens. And, um, but to your point, I mean, I, I know it's, it's hard for people to do that and wrap their heads around it. I will say like, if, if you ask anybody who knows me, I think the, you know, not giving a fuck about what people think about me is, I mean, I, that's probably my number one characteristic. I just don't care. Um, you know, and if, if you don't like what I'm going to do or, or how I'm going to do it, and it's not like in a rude way, but it's just like, I, it, it doesn't impact me 
other people's opinions about me. And I think the, mo the more you can do that, the easier it'll become to, to do what you want. And not I think, that. and, and you, you hinted at it. It's par I think parenting, like growing, yeah. like I'm the same way as I had so many people tell me not to do this. And then my parents, they're like, we believe in like, you know, and yes. they're entrepreneurs. And like, that yes. is so I, I think about it. Imagine if your parents said I, they didn't know, like, this is a really yeah. bad idea, then having to go still do it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> Again, knowing myself, I probably still would have done it. But I, I that would have been so much harder if there was that pressure of like, hey, how are you going to pay off your student loans? How, how yeah. are you going to pay rent? How, how are you going to do anything? Um, if that if those were the types of conversations, it would have been so much harder uh, to take the leap. So I, I really have to credit them because again, not all parents would do that. A lot of parents would, would put the, and be like, ah, oh, you need to do this for five years before you're able to take a risk like that or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So totally. as, as you talked about the, the dark years, so to speak, and we can get into as much of this as you like, but um, we absolutely had, again, I don't know how much people know, but our, our success was not instant. You know, we, we absolutely had, you know, really three years, um, of real struggles where we were hanging on, I'm, I'm talking by a thread. Like there is, there are so many scenarios, you know, if, if, if you ran this, you know, if you automated this through, through some program, you know, 999 times, probably more, um, we're not sitting here talking and, and we would have failed because we needed so many things to go right at the time that they went right too. It wasn't just about what happened, but when it happened and, and had everything not happened, almost exactly how it happened uh, again I'm, I'm not sure we'd be sitting here um so is that where you feel that like uh, do you believe in fate like like where, where you know we talk about greatness and you look, you look at you look at the last dance i agree with you like i think the per, like most people don't realize the percentage of successes to the level that you've experienced success are so minimal that yeah. everything that happened had to have happened the way it did for you you know to have achieved what you did so yeah I mean, I don't, um, I'm not religious, so I, I don't, right. I don't, I don't believe in, in, in that aspect of it. Um, I, I fundamentally believe you make your own luck. Um, so I think the, the luckiest people in the world are the hardest working people. In the world. Right. Um, and then I also think, um, I mean, again, part of it is, you know, I, I really think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and I don't mean like, you know, mind over matter or, or, you know, you can do anything you want because no, I, I can't be an astronaut, but um, within reason, if, if you put your mind to it, um, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like it worked out because, you know, we made it work out um, and, and it wasn't something that was going to happen any other way. And it's hard to explain it because I, again, in high school, you know, I, I think a lot of my, my friends and stuff, um, I, I think outside looking in, they're like, Oh, of course, Doug is successful. Of course he made it. But again, it's, it's all like external factors and external validation in terms of they think I'm successful because they've read about Halo Top or because they've heard about Halo Top. And it's not at all about like, what could I control in that process? And, and, and that's really all I ever focused on was like, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Like I can't control so, or there's too much external that impacts uh, what happens there. But, but I sure as hell can control how hard I work, um, you know, what are the 10 things that need to happen in front of me? Um, let's knock those out one by one and then pick our head up and see where we're at. Like that, that's really where all of my time and energy and focus was. And, and again, I, I think it's part of that. Like you've got to be able to get that tunnel vision, get in that zone. And again, block out the noise. Like you were talking about all of that's kind of part of the same process where, um, you just can't, you just can't let it get to you. So I think, I think that's a great segue. Let's like, paint a little picture here. So you had just agreed to join Justin to start selling, you know, Halo Top into stores. Like where were you guys when you quit your job and went all in? How much distribution did you have? How, how much of a business was it when you really made that leap? Yeah, uh, so it was very little. So we had um, in 2012 before I joined, um, it was probably about $10,000 in sales, uh, mostly kind of like small independents in and around LA. And then I came on right around when like we were meeting with, Whole Foods in the Northern California region. Um, I think Justin had met with Sprouts and, and had, you know, a confirmed launch or as much as a confirmed launch is ever confirmed in our industry as we Yeah, found. I know, th know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so it, it was kind of like, it was on the cusp of, of getting some stores and, and, and getting, expanding at least kind of regionally in the, in the West and Southwest. Um, and, you know, I, I hopped on right then and, uh, 
we, we hadn't capitalized yet. So we had to raise money. That, that was one of the first things that I helped do in terms of both the, the legal documents and, and actually bringing in the money itself. Um, so we, uh, I joined in early 2013. We did our first round of financing from April to September 2013, raised 500,000. Um, it was all friends and family. So, you know, anywhere from 10,000 bucks to, I think our biggest investor might've been 30 or maximum 40. Um, and we ended up doing one more round of financing in 2015 at a million dollars, but same kind of thing. It was all friends and family. Uh, it was straight common equity. We didn't do any of the, you know, convertible notes or safes or um, preferred equity. It was just common equity, no voting rights. You know, here's a valuation, uh, let's everybody get comfortable with it. And, um, we can get into all, all of that, but, uh, that's essentially how we did it. But yeah, I mean, I, I basically joined, um, right then. So 2013, that was our first full operational year. Uh, that's when we ended up in Sprouts. I think we launched there in about April, uh, March or April, probably. So you went, you went, you had Whole Foods NorCal and Sprouts. Those were like the two places that you started or? We thought we had Whole, Whole Foods NorCal. Uh, that was the and first uh, sales meeting I attended. So I, I went up there with Justin uh, there, there in Oakland. Um, and uh, I think that would have been January. And it was one of those where, again, we the buyer told us it was a confirmed launch, but I, I don't actually think we launched in the Whole Foods NorCal until the following year. I know we didn't launch in 2013, um, right. but we did, we did launch into Sprouts. Um, and then from there, you know, Gelson's and Bristol Farms followed some of the, the local LA chains, uh, Southern California chains. Um, and we just pounded the pavement in terms of like, I, I would send hundreds uh, of emails a week. I would call the corporate offices and, you know, you just try to, make up a reason why you need the buyer's contact information and you hope the, the admin or whoever answers the phone is, you know, not slick enough to not give it to you. And then you, <laughs> then you just fire off an email or call the buyer um, and try to get a meeting. Um, and that's, that's what we did for uh, a number of years. And then we of course explored brokers, um, which I, I'm sure everybody in the space has uh, banged their head against the wall, uh, trying to deal with and manage the brokers. Um, I know the feeling, man. Know the feeling. Good. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Okay. So, um, when, so, so, so you had sprouts, um, you had a couple other regional grocery chains. Um, and you know, I definitely can relate. You're sending all these emails, just doing whatever it takes guerrilla warfare to, yep. uh, to win accounts. Um, would you say it was kind of like a slow, like you had sprouts, you had a couple other accounts, they were performing well, or, um, you know, was it instant? Like this was working, you got the velocities you needed and you started scaling or what was happening? Yeah, so absolutely not. So let me, I'll just give you kind of the first <laughs> version of, uh, of what we were doing. Um, so we, uh, we got into Sprouts. That was, you know, a couple hundred stores. Um, it's a big then, win for like your first chain, by the way. Like that's, you know. That's, that, yeah, no, that was huge. Um, we, so one thing that we didn't realize was, at least relative to Whole Foods, uh, the volumes of, uh, the rate of sale at Sprouts is, is tiny. Like Sprouts yes. expected you know, two units per store per week, Whole Foods expected two cases per store per week. Um, it was that big of a difference. So, but here kind of, here's our growth uh, curve. We went from, um, you know, 2013, kind of just sprouts um, in Whole Foods to in 2014, a few more Whole Foods regions. Um, we got Kroger or a, a test in Kroger, I should say. It was about 500 Kroger stores with a couple of flavors. Um, and at the same time, we started losing accounts. So Sprouts uh, discontinued half of our SKUs. Gelson's discontinued us as a brand. We ended up losing, I think, about half of our store count um, in 2014 uh, because we would, if you got in front of the buyers and you did the right pitch and it was a buyer who was willing to listen, oftentimes they might launch your product. But within 12 months, when the next category review comes around, our velocity wasn't anything close to, um, we certainly weren't flying off shelves. I'll put it that way. And often we were well below that kind of discontinue threshold. On top so, of that, what people don't realize is what makes this industry so hard is you're it's so competitive to get the shelf space. Sometimes you have to pay for the shelf space with slotting and then you're paying that money for the real estate and then you lose it in 12 yep. months. Exactly. Insane. It, Insane. It, it's, it's a shame that, that nobody talks about that because the big guys also, they don't play fair. Right. So we can get into this when we actually did start to succeed and, and we're flying off shelves. The big guys were offering, I'm talking seven figure sums of money to say, don't give that space to Halo Top. Not even trying to get the space for themselves, just saying, hey, we'll pay you not to have Halo Top or not to have. See, this that's space. crazy. I've never heard, I, I knew, look, I've seen things where like you're getting tags pulled and yep. this Frozen is such an, it's a, you know, a duopoly. You've got a couple major players that are really owning the real estate. 
but you're saying there were like sums of money out there like to stop you from getting this, the shelf space. Oh yeah, we had great relationships wow. with a few buyers and they would tell us what Unilever and Nestle now for Nary, which is Nestle's part of that too. But um, yeah. yeah, no, they, they told us what the types of stuff that they were offering and you get it because you know, they'll have, <laughs> They'll have their joint. You're going to have to ignore my dog. No, nah, you're cool. We can bring them on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, man, we, we heard a bunch of these stories about the, the lengths that they would go to to really try to keep us at bay. And, and uh, it was crazy. Like, you, you don't even think about it. Um, and then, of course, the retailer's like, hey, they're going to pay us a million dollars. What are you going to pay us? And we're like, we, we don't have a million dollars. Like, what do you mean? Yeah. Um, it's wild crazy crazy um okay so here's a question just from my personal experience what's it like when you are launching conventional versus natural and how are you were you guys doing a strong merchandising strategy was it more digital how are you supporting those accounts or or having you know issues supporting some of the others what things weren't you doing that you could have done in retrospect i'll just say katie uh <laughs> i used to work with she was, uh, telling, me, she was telling me to cut my hair it's the quarantine hair it's the so. flow Katie, yeah, it's a flow. We um, so in terms of what worked and what didn't, in terms of digital and whatnot, uh, we learned really early on that trade shows and demos did not work. Uh, took up a ton of time and a ton of money. And we thought, again, intuitively, you think, hey, just it's healthy ice cream that tastes good. Just have people taste it. That's all you need to do. Just demo it, and you'll start flying. But what we found is. You know, most people who, who have a free sample in a grocery store, they don't want to hear a five minute spiel about what's what they just hey, give me some free ice cream and I'm gone. And that's it. Um, they're not converting. So <laughs> they're absolutely not converting. Um, so we very quickly moved away from that and moved into digital and social and influencer marketing, um, all of which have now become buzzwords and are um, probably uh, I don't mean what most people mean by those things. Um, but if you can rewind back to 2013, I think Instagram had just sold to Facebook at the end of 2012, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you're um, right. So it was still a very new platform and it was kind of up and coming. You know, maybe it was the TikTok of, of 2013, if you will. It is. Um, you're spot on with that statement, man. I'm gonna quote and, you on uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But for us, that um, we we kind of jumped on that train and we said, hey, we wanna we wanna use that platform to find people. Um, who they don't need to be celebrities. We just want people, maybe they have a couple thousand followers. Maybe they get more than a hundred likes a comment uh, or a post, and maybe they get a few comments a post. And most importantly, they're, they're posting about like healthy lifestyles. They're posting about, you know, other fitness stuff or, or uh, protein or other products, um, food and bev items that they're eating or, or drinking that, that work. And we just reach out um, and direct message them and say, Hey, you know, I think, we, I think you'd like our ice cream. Can we get you some? Um, and it was that kind of grassroots um, uh, targeted marketing, so to speak, that we did on the influencer side, coupled with the, the actual digital marketing tactics that, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Google, et cetera, um, allow you to do where, you know, you can target it geographically, you can target it demographically, everybody knows. Um, but there are different ways to do it. And there's certainly uh, smarter ways to do it. But we cash is gold, as you know. And for us, it was we, we had to track every dollar so closely not to say that we knew it would generate profit, but at least to say we're comfortable and confident that it's a good spend. And when it came to trade shows, demos, I'm sure you've had to deal with the, uh, the store flyers. You know, they charge you an arm and a leg to be in their stupid flyer that's going to get thrown out as soon as it ends <laughs> up in somebody's mailbox. And you, so you, know, you, have pay, you have to pay five grand for that. And that's like, yeah, what you could do with $5,000 on digital marketing is massive in, in terms of the impact. So for us, it was always really fighting where we could against those costs and allocating as much as we could to that kind of targeted digital, which is, it's a fight with the retailer because they, you know, they have like internal metrics of like, hey, you need 90% of your vendors to pay for this. It's like, it's yeah, and, and what I will say that I love about your strategy, Doug, is I was, you know, as I've read about you guys, you guys are notorious for being anti-trade show. And everyone thinks the trade shows when you're ponying up 20, 40, whatever thousand dollars to get a booth in prime real estate. I love that you guys kind of flipped that and were like, no, we're going to go press, digital, influencers, and, you know, just grassroots. And, you know, you guys were able to really make a splash doing that. So Yeah, yeah, no, it, and, um, yeah, it, it worked out um, for us. I will say now um, it really has changed because now everybody does that. And so we've had to, again, constantly rethink and and. 
we just recently revamped our entire strategy again to kind of, you know, get even more granular and, and, and much more efficient with the spends. Cause now everyone's flooded that with money that obviously the cost goes up um, for acquisition and whatnot. Totally. So, um, okay. Back to what we were talking about is you guys are in those respective stores, you're growing. Um, and then you said you, what, what you mentioned, you had some issues with the product and then it wasn't quite moving. What, what, what ended up happening? Yeah. Um, I mean, so two, two issues, the main issue, as I, as we found out, you know, uh, product is king. Like you're, I think a lot of people get into this and they're like, Oh, let's be like Red Bull. Let's be like Nike. Like we're going to be this lifestyle brand and so cool and whatnot. And, uh, we learned sometimes the hard way that it's really just about the product. And of course you want a good brand, but I really think it's 90% product, 10% brand, uh, in ice cream. And for us, uh, the product was not good enough. Um, so right off the production line, it was good, but you know, the frozen supply chain, I mean, my God, it's a freaking nightmare. Insane. <laughs> um, so by the time it went from production facility to truck, to storage, to truck, to retailer, to, you know, getting stocked on the shelves, uh, the consumer had just a, a horrible experience with it. And, you know, maybe it was chalky, maybe it was flaky, maybe it had melted and refrozen. Um, and, and so we weren't getting the customer retention. And um, Justin Wolverton actually uh, spent, I think it was about a month um, uh, with a dairy scientist, just, just kind of doing hundreds, if not thousands of tests uh, to improve that formula in 2015 um, to make it more resilient. But it was a, a pretty massive reformulation for us to make sure that by the time the end consumer had it, it performed at least a lot closer to what we were tasting right off the production line. Um, so that was critical. And that started to hit shelves uh, in the middle and towards the end of 2015. And at the same time, uh, we had done a, we did a full rebrand uh, to the brand you essentially see today. Um, and the old brand, um, I should have brought a photo or something so you could see, uh, it's pretty bad. Um, I've seen but, it. I've seen it. So, yeah. but it, it's not that bad, but uh, you know, I, I understand when you look at what Halo Top's brand is today, it's stunning with the gold rim. Um, yeah. And that was our, our, so we kind of said, that's the product on the inside, the packaging is the product on the outside. Uh, once we rebranded it to make it again, we looked at, you know, the apples of the world and we said, we want it to be minimalist. We want it to be, you know, aesthetically beautiful. So somebody will want to post it on Instagram and whatnot. Um, I mean, that, that's what we thought, but we fixed the product on the inside, fixed the product on the outside. And then in early 2016, we got some really lucky press. Uh, one was a GQ article. Um, uh, that <laughs> I think the title was what it's like to eat this magical, healthy ice cream for 10 days straight. Um, where this insane guy actually ate literally nothing but ice cream, our ice cream for 10 days. Um, but it's a hilarious Crazy. article. Um, and it went viral. And then that was followed a week later by a Buzzfeed article that did a taste test of us, uh, Hagen Dazs, and at the time, um, a brand that was um, much bigger than us uh, in the healthy ice cream space, but was water-based and candidly didn't taste very good. Um, and that was a really uh, great article for us because they- It wasn't know, Arctic Zero, was it? No comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but that was a really great article for us because they, uh, you know, they trashed the other brand. They talked really good about our brand. Um, and then they even had like some of our flavors stacking up the haagen And it was, those two hit it at the same time. My kids have now walked in, so. No, you're good, me. dude. All good, um, all good. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we had those two at the same time. Um, it put millions of eyeballs on the product. And then from there, um, you know, it just kind of snowballed. And that, that's where we had the, that's where we finally hit that growth curve. Um, so my question cool. to you is, do you think those types of press hits still happen five years later or is it a different media distribution landscape? It's a great question. Um, I mean, there's no doubt. I think the viral nature of the GQ article and the Buzzfeed articles happen. They probably just don't happen like that anymore. Um, now it's, you know, oftentimes, you know, honestly, it'd be, you know, somebody makes a hilarious TikTok or, or um, you know, something much shorter or, or, I guess the content consumption has changed a little bit um, as opposed to kind of your traditional, you know, let's go read an article on GQ.com like that. That doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, so, yeah, but I, I do think you can absolutely still have that moment, you know, where, where, where things go viral. Um, and that's kind of, again, the product or the company, for lack of a better word, it went viral with that because we didn't get. I mean, the press came after that, but mostly it was just word of mouth and people who didn't know 
Halo Top existed, trying it, being like, oh my God, I, this is incredible. Like, I got to tell everybody about it. That, that's what the snowball was. For the us. word of mouth that you guys had on your brand. I mean, I, I, I comp it to, I think Dirty Lemon had a pretty incredible moment from a press yeah. perspective. Um, there are a few other brands, RX Bar, um, Crave Jerky, a few yeah. others that have had these ripple effects where hundreds of like awareness at a hundred million plus level. And you guys are one of them. And I just remember this wave in that 16, 17, 18 and watching you guys. And it's, it's wild. I mean, it's really incredible yeah. when that all happens and, and it, it all kind of, it, it was truly, fruition. it was truly insane, man. And we, uh, we did not expect it because we, that had just been like, we didn't get into this much, but Justin and I both, when we raised money that second time in 2015, we, we had a conversation where we explicitly said, uh, we're done. Like, hey, if this, as soon as we run out of this money, we're not raising money again. We were both already so burnt out. Um, and it's just so depressing. When you Can you talk stuff. about that? Because that is, that's what I really want to dive into. Like success is incredible, but yeah. not enough people talk about this. You were done. You had raised money. Why would you? So like, what, fill me in on that. Absolutely. Um, I mean, so we had, this would have been again, end of 2015. So it was like three years of, um, it, it's not working out that well. I mean, that, that's the best way to put it, I guess, is you're, you know, for how long are you going to swim upstream before you say, I got to do something else like this just isn't it. Um, you know, it's not resonating with consumers like it needs to be. We're not cash flow positive. We, we we're working 80 hours a week, a hundred hours a week. Like we have no, no personal life. We have no money. We have no, we're pro both personally bankrupt if this thing doesn't work out. Um, I think we were both just kind of like exhausted mentally uh, from that, where it was just like, you know, let's get on with our lives one way or the other, either this works or this doesn't. Um, and the runway, we had about 15 months. So at the end of 2015, when we finished that raise, it would have taken us to the end of 2016. And that, that was kind of our, we said, look, we're going to do this for another, you know, year plus and see where we're at. And if, things didn't, this is why I was saying, if things didn't happen like they happened, we, we wouldn't be here. Like we both right. would have the company. Well, it wouldn't have been our choice, but we would have run out of money. And it's really painful to raise money too. I mean, you, you and every other entrepreneur knows that. Like it's incredibly the, painful. It's so pain. It's a full-time job. Um, you know, nine out of 10 people are going to say no. Um, one out of 10. How many, how many investor meetings do you think you took? Well, we ended up with 49 people on our cap table. Um, and those are the successful ones. So if you imagine for every successful investor meeting you had, we probably had what, at least four or five unsuccessful ones. So, you know, there's no doubt we had north of 100, you know, north of 200 meetings um, between the two uh, capital raises. So it sounds was, familiar. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> uh, that, that to me, that's the most painful part, though, is like, you know, you're asking people for money, um, you're, you're asking them to believe in you to believe in the product, uh, the product. And it's a uh, it's just hard. Um, and yeah, it's hard to get back there mentally. I hope I never am, but, um, how yeah, about just, the pressure of you've taken all this money from people and their expectations. And yes. that's another thing that people don't really talk about is it's really hard to raise money, but it's also you, you 49 people that you're in constant communication with and you want to, you know, basically, you know, you, you have these really lofty goals for yourself and you want to make this thing, uh, successful. And no matter what, you have days where the product's messed up or the supply chain's effed or yeah. you lose an, a huge account, but, you, but you're not going to put a sour face on, you know, you're going to show up and make it happen. Yeah. No, I mean, that's so number one, you took other people's money, uh, usually your friends and family who you know personally. So you, you feel now if you fail, it's not just your failure. You, you've now lost their money. And no matter what they say about, oh, we don't care. We're going to act like, you know, whatever, if something happens with it, that's great. If not, it can go to zero. I mean, nobody like risks their home or anything to yeah. invest in us. We know that, but you, you still feel an incredible amount of, uh, or at least I did, an incredible amount of, of both loyalty and responsibility uh, to those people. I will say though, expectations are a weird thing. So then when you hit on your growth curve, then everybody's like, oh wow, like our 10K, we could just retire uh, if this thing happens right with Halo Top. And then then you have that entire other expectation of like, this thing better sell for, you know, $5 billion or I've failed. And it's like, good God, like, um, you know. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I mean, I there was a press article 
Uh, I mean, I've, I've, watched, I've read most press about you guys. have been following you forever. There's a press article that said that you were rumored to sell for a billion dollars. This happened, happened, I think it was 2018, 2019, yeah. and that you guys are going through a process. And so were you guys going through a sales process at that time or was it just great press? Uh, we were not. Uh, that, so that article in particular, uh, I remember it because we were like, what on earth? It, I think it said Unilever walks away from a $2 billion deal or something right. like after right. weeks, after weeks of due diligence, right. um, everything about that was, was false. Uh, we were not in the process. We were not speaking to Unilever. Uh, there had not been weeks of due diligence. Um, and it's one of those things where like, it makes me question uh, the press. Like I, I think everybody in the press expects to have this benefit of the doubt. Like it's still, you know, 1960. And, and, and but when you're allowed to print articles like that, that are provably false, like, there's literally not a grain of truth in there because you have some anonymous source who's probably working at Unilever, who's probably trying to poison the well. Like why the hell can CNBC publish that? That's bullshit. Um, and it really pisses me off if you can't tell. Um, but so, I, I, that's so powerful, man. And no one talks about this. So that's why yeah. I'll keep going. Sorry. I'm, I'm... Yeah. Well, I was just going to, I mean, that, that to me is, I, it, it serves a purpose and the purpose is to help Unilever and, and to hurt Halo Top. And it, yeah. and it's also, it's false. It's not true, but like who the hell is going to know that? Like if I read something on CNBC, you assume it's true. Like, you know, it, it's in writing, it's published by a reputable organization must be true. Right. Bullshit. Um, and, and so that, that actually, that really made me lose a ton of respect uh, for the press generally. And also, <laughs> You know, I just don't give them the benefit of the doubt anymore. Like, you, if you want my trust and my respect, you have to earn it. And, and that goes for anybody in the press now, too. Um, because I, what else can you do when I, that's one example? You could find a million other examples of, of stuff much more serious than that. How, how, about the fact, how about the fact that you've got young upstart entrepreneurs that are reading these headlines that most of the time are false? Yep. So there's this false image of what, a, of what success looks like in the CPG space. Everyone yes. is chasing. You have yeah. unrealistic top line revenues, unrealistic margin expectations. You've got investors and people vocalizing what they're looking for and what they're trying to create. And sometimes it's, it's not even feasible. Like if you look at CPG brands, most of them lose money for the first few years. Everyone's talking about profitability. Yes, there are, there are exceptions to the rule, but sometimes there's this glossy image that's created of like the CPG exit. And you guys, frankly, are like a poster child of that. And that's why it's yeah. so important for you to, kind of talk about what that really means. Yeah, no, 100%. And again, I mean, we ended up, we obviously went through a process and ended up selling the company or selling the US and the Canadian part of the business later on. But again, at the time, none of that was happening. And again, it, it just sets all these unreal, unrealistic expectations, both for other entrepreneurs and also your investors who are now like, uh, we read 2 billion. So where's that number? <laughs> You're like, Come on, man. Like, that's a joke. Whereas I, after going through the process and seeing how hard that is to have the stars align where like some big company will actually want to spend $1, much less $2 billion to buy you. I mean, any company that sells or gets to an exit, as far as I'm concerned, is a unicorn. Like it, it is so hard to get any company to spend any amount of money to buy you. Um, and there's such a limited universe of buyers, especially in frozen, especially in ice cream. So that's another yep. one that I, that I learned the hard way. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it's tough, man. And then to your point though, you, you have all these, now every invest, we've probably done a disservice to other startups, uh, especially in this kind of like health and wellness uh, food space, because now every one of their investors is gonna be like, you should be the next Halo Top. Like, let's make this a, a billion dollar thing. And it's like, dude, that's, that's not realistic. That wasn't realistic. Disservice, but also pioneer. And you've opened up the opportunity for people like ourselves where everyone previously was like frozen's too hard, you can't just break through. So disservice, yes, because of unrealistic expectations, but service and the fact that there's opportunity for innovation. Fair enough, fair enough. I, I hope we've helped in some way, but uh, <laughs> I, I, am, uh, I am disappointed in, in how the kind of, the valuations and sale process, how that whole thing's been reported on on us from day one, it's, it's just been fake news, which is disappointing. Right, right. So I guess what, what advice would you have for, for people like myself or for other people entering this space trying to build a CPG brand because of unrealistic expectations, maybe some of the real, the, the, the truthful 
uh, realities of doing it. But also, I mean, I, I love what I do and I'm, I'm, I feel really grateful that I get to do this every day. So maybe, maybe yes, I, we've heard about some of the really intense times, but you, you still are doing this uh, internationally. You've yeah. got to still love what you do, correct? Yeah, um, I, I think I, I started to love what I do again. I think I, think I okay. towards the end, I, I had definitely lost, um, you know, the fun, the passion, you know, whatever you want to call it. I, I had I had gotten into a really dark place um, and I think I've finally gotten back to like what I actually do love about this. And, and um, I don't know, for me, it comes down to um, number one, your team, right? So if, if you, if you work with people and usually at a startup, it's a, it's a small environment. Everybody's going to know everybody personally. You're going to know the spouses, you're going to know the siblings, you're going to know, you know, the dogs, the cats, whoever, but I think surrounding yourself with people, um, who you really enjoy working with uh, and you can build not just a team, but the best teams always talk to themselves as families. Like you can actually build this family environment where it's all for one, one for all, one of us fails, we all fail. Um, you know, I, I think there's something really awesome about that collective spirit that I feed off of. Um, and, and I absolutely love being part of that. I, I love helping to try to lead that. Um, and I definitely lost that, uh, you know, kind of halo top, it, it had become a beast, like too big of a beast. I'd lost complete control of it, to be honest. Um, yeah. And, and, and it, it was controlling me uh, in a lot of ways. So I think that getting back to the basics in that sense of like, you know, getting a small intimate team together, getting the, you know, exact people uh, who you want to work with, um, you know, getting all the egos out of the, out of the room. Um, all of that stuff was critical. Um, and then of course, you know, in terms of the substantive stuff, I, I think people get lost in brand. Uh, I really do. Um, I think people spend way too much, and we did. We absolutely did uh, spend way too much on brand marketing um, and, and trying to be or become. It's it's another one of those things where you know if you look at a Red Bull or a Nike or I don't know your other kind of quintessential lifestyle brands, um, it, they would probably have the same conversation I'm having about the the you know press article saying that Unilever was going to buy us for two billion dollars. Where it's like don't don't try to do that because you know you'll you'll it's unrealistic first but then you'll you'll waste so much money when when it comes to cpg particularly in ice cream and most food categories it's all about the product and that's where your time and money should be is on r d on innovation constantly improve it constantly come out with new stuff um you know that that's where we now spend all of our time and money and i, I love that too um but it, it's it's much less on like let's create a cool commercial um, like that doesn't matter anymore. Um, it, it's more of like, let's get a great promotional calendar and let's great, let's create some great products and the rest will take care of itself. It's awesome. That's awesome. And, and, and I agree with you. I, I will say like for us, brand has been so important, but at the same time, what, focusing on making sure that you're going to get that retention with your customer, repeat purchase, and just being the best in the category. There's so many products on the market with the influx of capital that I really just feel are glorified marketing companies. They all use the same contract manufacturers. You're never going to win if there's yeah. not truly a, a better product functional benefit or, you know, you guys were all about low calorie, high protein and, and, yeah. and just thinking better for you. Um, so I guess my, another question I have for you, Doug, is are you like, a, would you consider yourself a mission driven founder, a values driven founder? Like when you were, you know, you mentioned you were in some pretty dire financial straits, what kept you going? Like what was your deep internal, like why that you're going to keep waking up every morning and leading your organization? Um, it's a great question. Um, to be honest with you, I didn't, I probably didn't think about it like that. I, I, I didn't have like an ex existential crisis or anything in terms of asking myself like why get out of bed in the morning like um what else am i going to do you know what i mean it wasn't yeah yeah it wasn't it wasn't really uh uh but to your point in terms of like you know what is the deeper meaning um i don't think i thought about it enough and did it enough uh the first time around it is one of the first things that we did um on halo top international is we said hey let's we kind of lost control a bit of the culture of the mission um, and that's because we didn't take the time to think about it, to write it down and to actually answer that question for ourselves. Um, and again, for us, it, it came down to controlling what we can control. So we focus really internally. Um, and number one, if we're not having fun, we're doing it wrong. And I'm just not going to do it if I'm not having fun anymore. So that was first and foremost, it was very personal to me because I, I had really gotten away from that. Um, the second, uh, of course, was all about team. Like th this is a team environment. There's no individual. 
Um, this isn't about individual accolades. Um, and I can tell you right now, all, I don't want to say all I want to do, but a huge motivation for me um, is, is, is building up uh, all of the people around me, all of the people, all the employees who put their blood, sweat, and tears into this thing with me. Um, I absolutely want them to have recognition. I want them to have money. Um, I, I want them, I want them to share uh, in this process. And, and it's, I, I can't tell you, nothing would make me happier than if every single employee could become a millionaire. And we are absolutely nowhere near that. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, just aspiring to something. If you're like, my God, if you could, you know, just, just make all of these people um, millionaires, how cool would that be? And that, that's something I think about. I'll, I'll be honest, I really do. Um, and, and would love to work towards it. But, and then the third thing for us is we, um, we really want to focus on uh, profit. Like at the end of the day, it is a business. And if you lose focus on that, then you're not going to, you're not going to be able to do anything. That, that's what actually gives you the opportunity to do it. So you, you got to make sure we were chasing revenue a lot. Um, but if you're going to chase revenue, it better be the right type of revenue. It better be profitable revenue. And if you protect your profit, um, you know, then you'll remain cash flow positive. You'll remain profitable. Yeah. Maybe you don't grow, uh, you know, maybe it takes you 10 years, not five years. Uh, fine. You know, but at least you control it. At least you don't risk losing it all. Um, which when you have other people, uh, employees in particular, depending on you uh, in the organization for their livelihood, that, I think that's really important. You, you got to focus on that. So I think a lot of companies nowadays really stay away from the idea of money and profit. But like, I, I think it's critical. You got to think about that. Like you're, you're not going to be here if you don't make that a key focus uh, of what you do and why you do it. Um, the days of, of folks just using the next round of funding to move, to propel an unsustainable business with unit economics that are negative or, or far and few, you know, it's, yeah. there are not going to be a lot of companies that sustain that. Um, so I hear, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I guess, you know, as we kind of wrap this up a little bit, uh, one thing I want to ask is just things that you would have done differently um, as the business was really scaling. If there's, I mean, that's really unfortunate with the media blast. I didn't really know the, the honest truth. I just read and, you know, assumed I knew. Uh, but what, what, what could you have really done differently? Because you, here's the thing, you're incredibly successful. Uh, you know, people like myself and other founders aspire to, to sit in your chair. But what could you have done differently to have an even better outcome? Uh, so much, uh, to be clear. So number one, you got to, if you want to do this, I think you have to be, um, you have to self-reflect, you have to critically think, and you got to be brutally honest um, in, in terms of how you critique yourself. So uh, yes, Halo Top got to an exit event. And yes, that is life changing for me and incredible. But I, I made so many mistakes. And there's so much I can learn from. That's why I'm so fired up about Halo Top Internationals. Like, who the hell gets a second chance with a company that actually does material revenue? Um, that you can, you know, has a brand that has real legs internationally, just like- Can you, can you just share what it is, what that is now, what that organization looks like? Yeah, so in, in terms of international? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we're sold in like about 25 countries. Um, you know, it does about 30 to 40 million. Like it's not nothing. Um, it's awesome, man. It's and, amazing. You know, <laughs> again, it's not a billion dollar company by any means, but like yeah. that's, that's enough where you can build a sustainable business on. Um, and uh, again, for us, it was- um, I actually now get to take all these learnings that I'll talk to you about in two seconds and apply them. Like, how cool is that um, to the brand that I helped help build and, and create and whatnot? It's, it's awesome, man. So um, uh, key learnings, though, were, again, a, a lot of this will be redundant with some of the stuff I was saying earlier. Um, we spent, I think we spent upwards of $40 million, I kid you not, on brand marketing in 2018 and 2019. Um, probably should have spent less than 10. Um, and that, that's literally, yeah, I mean, think, that's insane, right? 30 million plus dollars annually out the door, not generating sales for you. Like, what Crazy. are you doing? Um, which, again, it's hard to even talk about those numbers now because it's like, how, how on earth did we not realize that or, or fix that? But um, now that we've kind of revamped it and we've said, hey, product is king, you know, brand can be the prince, but, you know, product is king. That's where the time and money needs to go. Um, it, that was a huge one. And then on the team side, really on the um, employment and, you know, the, the culture side of the business, just saying, making sure we don't compromise there, making sure we get the right people there. Um, I think that was critical. And, and there's still some work to do there. Don't get me wrong. But I think it it is night and day different um, already. I feel it. I think everybody else feels it. It, it affects your mood, right? Like I'm, I'm happy to get up in the morning and, and 
and work and whatnot. It's, um, it's really fun, man. So I think that getting the culture right and then getting the, the P&L right, particularly the marketing spend, um, that, that was the biggest substantive issue, I think, that we had to fix um, uh, with, with Halo Top International. So, like I said, you, you, get, awesome, a, man. you get a second chance like that. It's, um, I still got to pinch myself sometimes that it's like, man, who, who gets a second chance with that type of head start? It's pretty cool. Couldn't agree more, man. Well, all I want to say, Doug, is this means so much. I really appreciate you making the time, like the amount of wisdom and, and nuggets of, I don't know, just experience that you shared are so powerful. And, uh, you know, really congratulations on, on everything that you're, you're doing globally. And, you know, I, I really appreciate you making the time. I think uh, what you've built is incredible. And most founders uh, would, would kill to do the same. And, and hopefully uh, we can take a lot of these lessons and, and kind of push forward as, as we all continue building our, our respective businesses. So you got it, David, if I can help with anything, man, let me know. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. This was uh, this was awesome. Dude. One of my favorite episodes, man. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. You got it. Thanks, man. Later, bud.